my name's Ian Smith. I wanted to show that video, which was, uh, in terms of quality, literally just shot off my phone. And the reason I wanted to put that on was because I needed people who have perhaps never seen a live esports event to get some idea of the kind of excitement uh, that is generated amongst a live audience. What was happening there was that a German team called BIG, who at that stage were ranked 25th in the world in Counter-Strike, had just beaten the number one ranked team in the world in the semi-finals of ESL1 Cologne uh, um, earlier this year. And that was a German crowd watching a German team. And in that German team, the hero of that team is an English player uh, from Bradford called Smuya, who uh, was generating a phenomenal shout from the audience, both at a personal level and then for BIG as a team. And you can see the enthusiasm there. And that is reflected across multiple live events in esports. So, hopefully give you some flavor of it, but I'm gonna spend a minute explaining uh, a little bit more, but I'm gonna rush through this um, because what's of, I hope, more interest is to talk to Sam from Pinnacle about engagement with an esports audience, who they are, how you engage with them, um, and to leave sufficient time at the end for audience questions from you if you've got anything that's, uh, that comes out of what we have to say. So I am going to canter through this. We're around afterwards if you want to ask more detailed questions. But what I want to talk about is, is, is what eSports is. And I, I apologize in advance for the kind of uh, over-elaborate graphic here. There's so much to fit in in this. Um, but really, what eSports is is competitive video gaming. I know that sounds obvious, but I'm going to ask how many of you have been to a live uh, esports event, a LAN event? Okay, a couple, that's good. How many of you have watched esports online on, say, Twitch or uh, YouTube, Facebook, live? All right, good. Okay, so there's, there's some idea here. Um, so, as you know, I'm sure there are thousands of video games played by millions and millions of people, but a few of those games transcend simply gaming uh, to be competitive as between not just uh, a couple of people, because again, you're talking about a couple of hundred games that can be played competitively between people. What sets esports apart is that those competitive uh, matchups are watched by other people. In other words, it's competitive video gaming with an audience. And, and that makes a difference uh, because that's what drives the economy of the esports ecosystem. Games uniquely are owned by publishers, uh, and they are the kings of the esports world because they own the intellectual property that forms the basis of the entire industry. And so, uh, a very popular game, as you saw up on the video out uh, there, was uh, Counter Strike Global Offensive, which is a first person shooter played between teams of five. Um, that is owned by the Valve Corporation Incorporated of, uh, based out of Seattle in Washington State, New York. Sorry, not New York, uh, Washington. And they, um, they own that game. And you play it if you play Counter-Strike entirely at their will. They can take it away. So it's not in any way like a traditional sport like football in the sense that uh, Sam and I can start kicking a ball to each other here and call it football. That doesn't make us uh, Messi and Ronaldo in the new camp, but we're still playing football and FIFA, UEFA, the FA can do absolutely nothing about that. Uh, in contrast, we can start playing Counter-Strike and somebody from Valve can switch us off <laughs> uh, in a heartbeat. So they are the kings of the industry, but they're also reliant in terms of esports on tournament organizers. And one of those, uh, to give you a local example, here in, in, in a few days' time, we'll be running a tournament, the company here called Quickfire, uh, running a tournament for $150,000 in prize money between uh, a, a group of very highly ranked Counter-Strike uh, global offensive teams. And that event will be watched online by tens, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, young people globally. Uh, and yes, there will be a live audience here in Malta, but the reach of that event held here in Malta will be absolutely global. Um, I will leave you to look at that uh, in your own time, but I think it's uh, 
the, the other elements of this ecosystem so that you understand it are tournament organizers putting on events, professional teams who participate in those events, sponsors and broadcasters. So you'll see that in many ways it resembles traditional sport. The difference is that there are multiple parties involved. And what I'd say about that is that esports, in a sense, is a slightly misleading um, overarching name. It's a little bit like saying the Olympics. And in the same way as the Olympics has 26 or 28 events, and at one end you have, say, the 100 meter men's final watched by you know, 1.2, 1.3 billion people, and at the other end you have the synchronized swimming watched by 12 people. There's an entire spectrum uh, across that. Esports is exactly the same. At one end, you have uh, League of Legends World Championship watched by you know, hundreds of, uh, let's say, 100 million people, uh, something along those lines, 68, 70 million people online. Um, and at the other end, you have you know, 25 guys in a room playing Super Smash Bros or uh, Splatoon or uh, the, uh, one of the fighting games like Tekken or um, uh, th th that sort of thing. So we have that spectrum. So it's actually easier to think of esports as a series of standalone verticals where at the one end you've got Counter-Strike, League of Legends, Dota, uh, Dota 2 and Overwatch, which are your premium tier one events. And at the other end you have a range of smaller games, some of the fighting games like uh, the ones I've already mentioned. And uh, probably around 20 games in all that make up the world of esports uh, at a meaningful level. And because we're going to talk about uh, betting on esports and the implications for that, it's worth mentioning that the vast bulk of handle uh, across all of esports betting uh, centers on two games. One, uh, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and the other is Dota 2. And then we have strong showings from League of Legends and the Overwatch League. And all the other games make up the rest. I think that's a fair assessment, Sam. Yeah, those, those four games account for 95-plus percent of the turnover. Yeah. So, um, turnover, that that's, it brings us very, very nicely into the next slide. Now, look, of course we may be wrong. These are based on uh, Ehlers and Krejcik research that was done uh, well over a year ago. Um, the anecdotal evidence is that this is pretty accurate, um, uh, but I'll give you an overview of my definitions because they're not widely used within, within the industry. Bear in mind that I'm coming at this from an integrity angle. So. In blue, we have what I call the visible markets. These are the ones that you can go online and find. If I want to, uh, if I want to bet on Counter-Strike and I know what I'm doing online, I'm going to find about 200, 210 operators. And I'm not making any comment within that on whether they are regulated, unregulated, licensed, unlicensed, legal, illegal. I can find them. I can open an account and I can bet. The red is the invisible markets, which are the ones that uh, you know about that are accessed in other ways, whether that's mobile, through personal connection, through uh, dark web, uh, and that sort of thing. But broadly speaking, what most people refer to as the uh, illegal or black market, where like traditional sport, that market tends to run at 10 to 15 times the size of the traditional markets um, and is centered very strongly on uh, mainland China and Asia. and historically on the US. Um, actually, I'm just going to pop back to that to give you the, the, the headline figure, which is that we expect handle uh, turnover in 2020 in esports betting to hit in excess of about $150 billion. Um, even if I'm half right, uh, we've still got a looming problem uh, from an integrity point of view, not from a market point of view. I think that's probably good news for most of you. Uh, most of you out there, it's just the predominance of the uh, illegal markets makes my life a little bit more difficult. So in 2017, um, these are the meaningful suspicious bet alerts that, uh, that, that we had. Um, as you'd expect, they are concentrated on the two games that give us uh, the most handle. Um, so there's no, there's no big surprise there. I think the surprise is really that uh, during the course of this year, where we have uh, more than a month left with a couple of big tournaments coming up, the, the two games that are showing and causing me the most concern are Dota 2, which is coincidentally was you know, during the course of early part of this year licensed into mainland China, um, generating both 
a, a large amount of betting action, but also a large amount of fixing. And Warcraft 3, which you can see generated one alert in uh, 2017, and in the rest of this year generated another 10. Um, thankfully, that league's gone away, which is nice. Um, so that's, that's what we're dealing with. Um, and so really the point of this, um, this session is for, uh, for Sam and I to have a discussion about betting on eSport, um, uh, which really is, is Sam's area of expertise. And what I was going to ask you first, Sam, is um, who is the audience? Who, who are these people watching, watching this, this well, product? We can say what they aren't. They aren't just the 15-year-old kids that are buying their game on Steam and playing the video game. That's not what it is at all. It's the, the Nintendo generation grew up and here they are and that's who your hundreds of billions, well, hundreds of millions of uh, viewers on the League of Legends World Championship are. It's just the adults are now playing the games with their kids and I don't know what the, the next generation is. If the, if the 40 year olds are now the Nintendo generation, or the, I don't know what, <laughs> what, you, what you want to call the teenagers now, but it's basically just becoming everyone under the age of, of 50-ish. Yeah. I mean, even, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, you, you could see on my, or you may not have been able to see because of the quality of my filming, but, you know, at ESL One Cologne this year, what was absolutely notable from, from the audience and walking around amongst them was the number of parents there with their kids watching. And, and they, they weren't just indulging their kids, they're into it. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. my sons come with me um, uh, to that event every year, and it's, uh, it, it's very, very exciting. Um, the, the other kind of phenomenon, I think, is, is to talk about broadcast within the context of eSport, is that most of you will know in sports betting that if you put something on TV generally, of course, um, let, let's say there's a, a range of matches in a particular competition on any day, the one on TV is the one that's going to generate by far the, the most turnover in, in, in betting. Everything in eSports is on TV in that sense, isn't it? Twitch TV, yeah, or a stream of some sort. If you if you count your computer monitor screen as TV, then yes, yeah. everything is basically on TV. Yeah. But that's the that's the real difference between the mm. the esports audience and the traditional audiences. You cannot reach the room through through your actual TV. Like the, a day in the life of, a, of an esports fan or someone that would be willing to mm. you know open their account and put money down on esports, he may not even own a TV. A, t a TV is a thing of the past almost in these people's lives. You know, yeah. in, in the younger generation, if you think you know they wake up, go, go to work. If his, his second monitor that's supposed to have his email open, that's going to be like the YouTube highlights of the game that he yeah. played before or like the, the highlights of the Twitch stream that he was watching the night before. That's not going to be anything to do with regular terrestrial TV. He'll go to the gym after work and he's listening to a podcast about the game that he enjoys to play or about a variety of different games. It might you know, be several different titles. Uh, and then the evening he'll be p playing the game himself or herself, obviously. Um, and nowhere in the context of this is watching... Uh, commercial on, on TV, you know, Netflix on your laptop is what TV is nowadays. There's no, there's no commercials in the 30 second window that doesn't really exist. But the, the opportunity is there's lots of times that throughout that day that mm -hmm. they're interacting with the game and with uh, electronics that are holding the information about the game, be it their, their tablet, their, their phone that they're listening to, the TV, the computer screen that they're watching. There's so many different times that they're paying attention and they're looking at stuff that's specifically about the eSport. You can reach them through those means, which is yeah. really quite easy at the moment. Yeah, and, and again, in normal traditional sports terms, the idea of throwing a relatively big event in a traditional sport in Malta uh, for a live audience wouldn't generally be a particularly attractive option. Whereas in eSport, you know that, in fact, even if only a hundred people turn up to watch these teams, it's almost guaranteed that there will be hundreds of thousands. Oh yeah, on, or viewing on, on Twitch or, or watching it some way, or like the, yeah, the, the highlights the next day, like I say on YouTube. Yeah, the, the, viewer, the viewership is just going exponentially up. Every, every single year, it just keeps on doubling, like I said, which makes, no, who knows when it's ever gonna stop. It has to at some point, obviously, yeah. but yes, as of yet, it still hasn't. Do you see at Pinnacle a direct correlation between the growth of that audience and the growth of uh, interest in your betting products? Yeah, well actually the, the, the reference of doubling every year was the, the turnover that we received every year since 2010 has doubled every year. I can't say what it exactly was in 2010. We only actually started towards the end of the year to be fair. Mm -hmm. But every single year a, a product that has, you know, a product being the entirety of esports, like you said, a bunch sure. of different titles, that has actually doubled every single year and it's now the 
while it's rivaling traditional sports as you would think of, but such as tennis, and while it's overtaken rugby, it's ahead of the American sports, it's behind you know, the, the biggest ones, such as the, the soccer or the basketball, but it's not that far behind, and still doubling every year. So I don't know what, what that means for the future, but it looks to be bright. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and it also, you know, it absolutely makes sense for an event to be held somewhere like Malta, which in traditional sports terms would make no sense at all. Mm -hmm. um, we saw that event last year in Mykonos, do you remember? And the players loved it. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, you know, we yeah. get to go to Mykonos, we come to go to Malta, you know, we don't have to fly and play in some stadium in yeah. Norway no, in, for sure. in the winter. Yeah, yeah, it really benefits everyone. When the majority, well, the huge, vast majority of the viewership is over the computer done on, on streaming services, with the actual event where it's held, it, it could be in my basement, it yeah. doesn't really make that much of a difference. Absolutely. For the, for the viewerships, that is. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and which is why I guess we see in places like Malta at the moment, uh, people like um, Gamers.com and um, World Pro Racing, Supernova, Quickfire and these companies, because why not? Um, now, okay, this is the key question in a way is, so we've got all these people out there and, and you know, it's quite a, a an interesting and wide-ranging demographic, how do we engage with them as, uh, as a betting company? Um, how do we reach these guys? Well, fortunately for Pinnacle, we were one of the first to even be offering eSports lines. So we kind of cheated our way in by being the only option when eSports was blowing up at the time. Mm -hmm. But certainly how we've reached more customers since then is the, the, the use of all the tools that I mentioned in the, the day in the life of the different times that they're interacting with with computers that can be used to show them the ads the, during the day, like the, the Twitch streamers, you can just, you can put Twitch streamers on your books, you can mm -hmm. offer them just to promote the game that you're saying, promote the website. All these, there's so many different times that they are looking at the screen, that they are paying attention and they're looking, they think, they're thinking about the game that they're look, wanting to play. So that's what's going on in their mind at the times. And you can just backdoor your way in with just some ads at that point because that's it's already what they're thinking about. You're not having to like come from a different angle. It's like, okay, I was watching an episode of TV and then all of a sudden, oh, the sports betting commercials in front of me. What's this all about? They're actually already thinking along those lines. They're already in the industry, yeah. whether they know it or not. And why do you think in particular CSGO and Dota 2 make up such a massive proportion of, of the betting? I, well, I, I guess because they're more popular in China, which is such a large percentage of the overall betting. I do know friends that work in uh, an American sports book, and they actually have League of Legends as their most well, profitable and the highest turnover. Yeah. So I think it really just comes down to where you're able to accept the customers from would be which right. game would be the most profitable or the have the highest turnover. Sure, sure. I think there must also be a case made for the fact that a generation of gamblers was effectively groomed by the skins markets mm -hmm. that existed through to 2016. Yeah, yeah. Um, which uh, largely dead from a sports betting point of view, not dead from a casino point of view, I guess. So yeah, if it's just, uh, yeah, if they're actually just yeah. in there to truly gamble, then yeah, that, that could be something different rather than the e-sports yeah. e betting, I guess. Is everyone familiar with skins betting? Is that, are we? <laughs> Teaching how to suck eggs, yeah? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, well, you can ask us about that afterwards as a very interesting uh, phenomenon, certainly at the time unique to esports betting. Uh, may, yeah. may not be anymore. Um, I guess it's uh, well known in casino type betting now um, or gambling. The, one of the other interesting things, um, just relating directly to Pinnacle, is that this is the first year I've seen you guys actually sponsor an event. Is that right, or have you done it before? Yeah, we've done it a few times, but generally not as, not as often as we are. Like, we didn't do anything before 2016, I think, and that was the first year we sponsored one, and then since then it's only been one or two a year, for sure. Yeah. But uh, we, we generally don't do much sponsorship, if that said. Like I said, we already mm. basically have most of the market already, so there isn't who else are we even trying to steal, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, and, and one of the things that's often touted within, within the industry is the low cost of acquisition. This is something that comes up in the uh, quarterly Ailers and Krejcik mm -hmm. review of eSports betting. Um, what's your experience of that? Yeah, it's, I mean, they don't cost necessarily that much less, but they, what they do require is uh, something specifically built for them. So if you have um, a landing site specific for eSports, if someone would uh, search Google eSports and then get redirected to your site, they need to not see your traditional sportsbook website. They don't want to see football, hockey, soccer, basketball, and then at the option, eSports be one of the specific games to play. They want to arrive at your website and see 
all of the esports. And at the end, there could be like traditional sports, and that takes you back to the original site. Once you've got that set in place, the actual cost of keeping people on that site is really relatively quite low, and lower than a traditional uh, gambler, for sure, because they're so much more invested. Their esport is their spare time, you know, mm. it's, it's all that they're really doing. Um, but you definitely have to target what their needs specifically. They, they, they might come over as needy, but generally it's just once you have everything in place for them already, the upkeep after that is really relatively low. Yeah. And look, my experience coming in from the other angle is be, uh, just for those of you who know or don't know, I, I come from a traditional sports background, so my work was primarily in cricket and uh, rugby, um, those sort of sports. And so I didn't really know what I was looking at when I came into esports at the, in the middle of 2015. But one of the things that's clearly emerged for me, other than the fact that it appears to me more or less the only way to reach this particular demographic, um, it's the common factor. But the other was that one of the, f one of the defining features of, of a game becoming an eSport is that it has to grow from the community upwards. Yeah. Um, th there's been one attempt to parachute a game into an eSports community, which is the Overwatch League, and I think the jury's still out on whether that's a thing. It's, what, what do you it's, think? I mean, it's surviving. I, I don't think it's necessarily growing or anywhere near at the rate that if a game had become that big organically, as you said, that it would, it would just keep on going. Like the whole nature of esports is just going to be growing. If you look at it relative to how big esports is, then it's actually dwindling on, on, by that measure. But yeah, that's because it was, as you say, just artificially put in. It's like, oh, we have this game. We're developing it to become an esport. Whereas all the bigger ones are just, this is a game and it's possible for people to view on it. And then that's what made them flourish in the first place. It, it's not, yeah, you're, you're right. Dropping a game in and forcing it is never going to pick up with the community as well. Yeah, and, and one of the, the words that I've, I've heard endlessly since I, I started looking and, and becoming involved and, and the very first live event I went to, which was the uh, Dota 2 major in Frankfurt in 2015, is authenticity. The, this is not an audience that's easy to fool. Um, you know, w w one of the things that struck me in particular was the first group of events that they had in Vegas. Part of the reasoning was that we need to get these young guys and we'll get them to walk through the, the casino floor and they're undoubtedly going to start playing slots and all this <laughs> stuff. And of course, they didn't. They, yeah. they, they, they don't do that. They're they there for the eSport. They, yeah. They, yeah. And they, um, they, they're there for the eSport. And you have, to, you have to cater to that very specifically. And authenticity is a major part of that. And I think, again, our, our, as observers, We'd say those sites where um, particularly big non-endemic uh, operators have come in and kind of added an esports vertical without exception, I would say those have failed. Yeah, I mean, I can't obviously speak for their numbers, yeah. but I don't think it's, you really need to, be, you need to be able to embrace it yeah. as it is, rather than try and squeeze it onto something you already have. You need, you need to, like, we have our, our Twitter, for example, Pinnacle Sports Twitter, um, for years we were, putting esports tweets into our, uh, into our regular Twitter feed, and they weren't getting any traction. And, and now esports is the only thing that has a separate Twitter outside of the Pinnacle Twitter, and it's been hugely successful. Because people that are interested in esports, they only want to see yeah. the tweets about all the esports. It can, it can be about all of the different 20 games that we're offering. That doesn't matter. But as long as it yeah. doesn't have any other, other sports getting in the way. Yeah, and that's what that's what we found works throughout thing. Not just the Twitter. That's the whole, like I said, the landing site, the the, the CSD. They need to be all fluent in how the esports genre works. Cool. Before we open up to questions, if there are any, um, to put to put our kind of personal area into the uh, into the mix, um, we're both involved in integrity. Um, ESIC is uh, it really exists primarily to deal with match fixing um, and. Our principal detection method around that is, is the um, suspicious betting alert network that incorporates Pinnacle, um, various regulators, and many other operators. Um, the, do you see any difference in, in the integrity space between what you do with regard to traditional sports and what you do with regard to esports? Um, yeah, well, there's definitely, how do we say, it's much more in its infantile stages, which is the true for the whole esports as a movement as well. Obviously, you know, I said 2010, really it's been in a thing for 20 years or so, but just generally the, the level of work that people are putting in to organize and fix the matches isn't up to the scratch of the ears of other sports. Basically, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for other sports, you're going to get some organized crime involved. They're going to yeah. be um, 
they're much more, how do we say this? They're much, they have much better game theory in how they would approach getting the money down in the whole worldwide market. Yeah. Whereas in esports, it's like, oh, I'm playing in this match. I can bet this much money. Maybe I should just throw the match. And some guy will make an account under his own name and then bet <laughs> against himself. It's yeah. not particularly hard to find. Whereas if you've got, you know, uh, Azerbaijan second division soccer match and there's money coming out of China through agents that are in Russia. I mean, yeah. okay, this yeah. is a good, good luck. And they're only betting two bets on your site. They're betting two bets on another site, yeah. two bets on another site. Whereas at the moment, esports is generally yeah. easier to find. But that's until, until organized crime realizes how much money they can bet on esports in the global market and how much possibly easier it would be to, to get away with it. And then that's going to be an issue, which... Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I mean, that was the whole point of the setting up of ESIC in, in, in the first place, is that looking ahead, you know, and we look at the graphic there, and again, if, if, you know, even if I'm half right, you're still going to get to individual markets that are actually worth fixing. Oh, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, to, to give some of my experience in this, is that when, when I did trawlbacks over, say, suspicious betting alerts 2015 in CSGO, we found probably about 150 fixed matches, all on the skins market. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they were all what you know, total Mickey Mouse stuff. It was exactly that scenario: team player, coach, kind of looking at a market and going, "Hey, if we win this game, we'll get 300 bucks each. If we <laughs> if we fix it, we'll get 600 bucks each. So let's do that." Um, but there is an exception to that um, historically, and, and 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 no doubt to some extent ongoing, was the South Korean Starcraft fixes, which were definitely. Proper fixing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, that. that's just, yeah. you know, they're so much more of an advanced market in the whole esports, like I was saying. Yeah. They're, they're years ahead of where everyone else has been. It's been, it was 20 years ago, there was a TV channel, was only esports, I think. So, yeah, you know, yeah. they're, they're, we don't even have that now in the Western world. So, yeah, they are, they're that much further ahead. I'm sure they were aware of what was coming. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, does anybody have any questions? Sorry, I can't see you all very well, but it looks like. Stunned silence. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I mean, I think, you know, I, again, to, to reiterate, I come from a, a traditional sports background, and so the sort of things that I was dealing with in cricket, which you're probably very familiar with, I mean, even if you're not familiar with cricket, you're undoubtedly familiar with the scandals that uh, arose, particularly around 2010 um, in cricket. And those were extremely complex investigations because they involved... Um, matches played in, say, Bangladesh involving players from New Zealand um, and England and South Africa and Zimbabwe with betting taking place in multiple places around the world um, and fixers who might have been Singaporean by birth but were based in Finland. Uh, and and you, you can see how complex that was. And really what, what we're trying to do uh, in ESIC is before we reach that stage, um, in, uh, as, as we see the growth and as, as people become more aware in, in the match-fixing organized crime industry, because there is one, that, that there might be money to be made here, is target harden, hardening the, um, the esports industry, which is not the easiest thing to do because there's no governing body to go to, mm -hmm. right? So uh, generally with any kind of um, integrity system, you, you can take a solution to FIFA, UEFA, the International Cricket Council, the rugby union uh, um, governing body, and they can implement it or not implement it uh, poorly or not. There is nowhere to go uh, in the esports industry. This is another specific element that you need to take into account when you're considering your entry into this market as an operator or any other way, is that uh, it, I wouldn't say it's chaotic, it's, it's gelling, but below the top tier of the top games, there's still a lot a mess. Um, you guys go deeper in the market than most. What are your fears there, or, or why, why are you confident in, in going down there? Well, yeah, certainly the deeper you go, the more risk there is. But mm. as you alluded to me before we started, there's uh, now there's real, real money being put into the second level of tournaments, like the, the professional tournaments or the games that are, the matches that are specifically run by the games developers, we have no issue with those whatsoever. But now that there's, and then it was like the second level was a, a little bit shady, we weren't quite sure what's going on, and we never really wanted to, felt confident offering anything in the third level because the lines move a huge amount, it's not a particularly great product for the sports book. The, the, 
the, the betting turnover isn't really that interesting either. Mm. Um, but now that there's more money being put into, like this is the event in, in Malta is going to be on the, the top tier, but the more money being put into leagues on the second level, the yeah. more that that happens, the better it is for everyone for, on the sportsbook side of things. There's just, the lines are much more stable, there's more interest about the event itself, more people are seeing about it, that the guy that is listening to his podcast throughout the day is like, oh, this event's happening, let me check it out. There's just so much more, uh, so much more information available about it. And the, the deeper that that goes, the more levels from pro to second level to third division, whatever you want to call it, that to get the funding and become major, that's got to be great for everyone involved in the sports betting industry. So yeah. we're willing to maybe even take a small loss on the, the lower level leagues just to promote the product enough to have everyone come back and be more interested in the second and then the professional level of it as well. Yeah, that oh, makes perfect sense. Um, in the absence of questions, obviously feel free to collar us uh, if you can afterwards. But um, thanks very much for your attention. Thanks. Oh, good job. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>